Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmen Yeti Mazera. I serve as Executive Director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, which all of your institutions belong. We're very glad to have you here today to participate in this webinar talking about the Catholic Relief Services International Development Fellowship Program. We're joined by some wonderful colleagues, including some alumni who probably remember well what it's like to be in your shoes as APSIA students. We'll be able to hear much more about the program, listen and take your questions. And then at the end, uh, we will have a recording of this session available on APSIA's YouTube page. So look for an email from me after this session with some more information about that, as well as some of our uh, invitations to upcoming events. We have a number of these webinars scheduled throughout the fall and I look forward to seeing all of you there. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat as we go. And if you have any technical issues, please feel free to send me a direct message and we'll do our best to take care of it. With that, I'm delighted to turn the floor over to Netta to begin our presentation and share all of her insights about the fellowship program. Actually, before she gets started, I do wanna say a special thanks to the Joseph Corbell School at the University of Denver and uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego, for setting up the session for the entire APSIA family. So thanks to them. And now, of course, Netta, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Carmen. This is so exciting. What a huge group. I'm so thrilled that we have the chance to talk to you all today. And so excited that you are interested in CRS, in Catholic Relief Services, and the International Development Fellows Program. Um, as Carmen said, my name is Netta Sopani, and I manage the International Development Fellows Program, as well as some other programs we have for, for professional development in the agency. And I'm really lucky today. I have two colleagues with me on the line. I'll let them say hello, Caitlin and Darren. Hi, this is Caitlin. Am I coming up with a weird name? I apologize. <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> you know what? I think this is because of my husband plays Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> so a little uh -huh. my personal life. I'm blushing really hard right now. Um, Caitlin, that's awesome. We were like, is she under some sort of other alter ego name or something today? But there you are. Awesome. Well, thank cool. you, Caitlin. And we have Darren with us today. Darren, would you like to say hello? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Darren Posey. I'm calling in from Togo and looking forward to talking to all of you. Thank you, Darren. Great. Well, we're going to get to hear from Karen and Darren, uh, Caitlin and Darren as we go through the presentation. Um, before we get started, I wanted to ask you guys to share in the chat. Um, if you're not in the classroom setting, if you're online and you have the chat option, um, if you already know something about CRS, anything about CRS, please feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, or if you've already worked with CRS in some capacity, just put a yes, um, you know, or something to that effect. So you just want to gauge kind of uh, what you guys know already coming into this session. And um, if you don't have anything to share, like what you know about CRS or haven't worked with CRS, if you could post any burning questions that you have, something you'd really like us to cover um, during the session, please put it in the chat for us. And I do see the, I am on it, I have the chat, um, Carmen, I can see it, so I'll be able to see. Um, okay, and I don't see anything just yet, so let me also ask you a little trivia question before we get going, just to have you guess, uh, how many countries do you think CRS works in today? Awesome, thanks. I see some great activity going. So good. Someone has a former coworker that was a fellow in DRC and has worked with CRS in Senegal. That's awesome. Um, yeah, do we offer internships? Great. Yeah, you know, some countries we're in, like Timor Leste, application timeline. Very good. I see we have a guess of 40 countries for where C how many countries CRS is working in. So fantastic. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, good, Stephanie. Yeah, you're, you're close. Awesome. So as you can see, hopefully on the slide, 
Today we're going to do a little quick overview of what I like to call CRS 101, just so you know a few basic things about the organization. And then the bulk of our time will be spent on the fellows program. And um, then we'll have a couple of chances to hear from Caitlin and Darren, and they'll tell you a little bit about their experiences as well. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin. She's going to start us off with CRS 101. And the answer to our first question is here for you already. Over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Samantha. Thanks. Um, and it looks like my name is now back to normal. Um, and it is confirmed that is my husband's TNT character name. Um, so as you can see on this slide, we work in 115 countries and we serve 140 million people. Uh, that number is growing all of the time as um, our organization has been growing a lot lately. Um, and to share a little bit of history about CRS, um, so CRS actually started right after World War II in results um, in response to the um, the amount of Polish refugees that were seeking asylum. So CRS actually started under war relief services, and the first project helped shepherd 1,500 Polish refugees um, into Mexico where war relief services set up a safe haven for education, training, and rehabilitation. Um, and now our mission has shifted from war relief to more long-term support um, in really the 115 um, countries where we work. And the bishops renamed the agency Catholic Relief Services. Today, CRS is one of the largest and most trusted international relief and development organizations. And the figures on this slide indicate um, and highlight the scale of our work, um, and especially our global staff. That's increased since I joined CRS. Um, it's now at 6,697. And um, we reach a large number of people annually. There's a large global team. And if you all wanna know more about the history of CRS and the impact of CRS, um, Netta will share a link in the chat so you all can learn a lot more about the history. Um, and here's some more CRS 101. Um, so now that you know a little about, a bit about CRS's history and the scale of our work in the world today, here's some information about our mission and our approach. Our mission is centered around human development and human dignity. Um, so this is responding to major emergencies, affecting disease and poverty and nurturing peaceful and just societies. So this is not just on the um, uh, emergency, but all the way through to making, to supporting people in, in thriving and not just resiliency, but just the whole spectrum. Um, and also Sierra serves Catholics in the United States. Um, so it's more of living in solidarity with other people across the world. Um, and, excuse me, I'm <laughs> reading off of notes. Um, so CRS's work is grounded in the Catholic social teaching. And on the right, you'll see our guiding principles. Um, and an example of how you will see our guiding principles um, reflected in our work is subsidiarity. It's a huge part of, um, of how CRS functions. So a higher level of government or organization should, the belief is that a higher level of government or organization should not perform any function or duty that can be handled more effectively at a lower level. So a level of people who are closer to the, um, uh, the the project at hand, the population that we're working with. Um, and um, the, uh, we believe that those people have a better understanding of how the problem, well, what problems exist, how to address them. And we see this principle in our focus on um, partnership. So CRS actually works with over 2000 local partners um, and they might be local partner organizations. Um, they might be, I worked with um, a farmers union, there's a lot of different variety in this. Um, and partners are local faith-based or and or secular organizations, governments, other INGOs, um, research institutions, and um, CIRIS always implements 
our programming with local partners, unless a partner has yet to be identified. Say an early onset of an emergency, um, that's when CRS is direct implementation, but we, apart from those very intense situations, um, we always work with a partner and we don't move forward with projects without partners. Uh, and this final slide, well, currently my final slide, um, is our 2030 goals. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there's actually information about this online and that it will share the um, link in the chat. As you can see here, we have five goal areas and, um, and our goals and priorities reflect the evolving needs and capabilities of the people we serve and our local partners. So what we're working to do is build on our current strengths while challenging ourselves to stretch, and grow and evolve our organization and our role. Um, and across all of our goal areas, you'll see that we practice a preferential option for the poor and prioritize reaching the most vulnerable and marginalized among our, um, uh, among our other <laughs> planet inhabitants, <laughs> um, other populations in the world. Um, and, and yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Caitlin, thank you so much. Um, I'll do, I'm going to jump back in here and share a little bit about why people choose to work for CRS. So um, as you can see, here's a number of things I put on the slide. And I think that if you talk to CRS staff around the world, you just really hear a lot of similarities and probably these common themes would come out. So of course, number one is, you know, doing something that you feel, you know, motivates you to get to work in the morning because you're having an impact and you're doing something that really tangibly helps improve the lives of others. So I think we're all really intrinsically motivated by that. And that is probably, you know, one of the things that people love most about their work. I would say it might be a little bit of a double-edged sword because we then do end up working very hard and sometimes, um, you know, spending a lot of hours because you have that feeling of like, if I just you know, wrote this one more proposal, I might be able to help so many more people, right? So there's, um, it can be really exhausting because it is really meaningful and it does matter. So um, the the next thing I would say though, that people that like, I think one of the best things about working for CRS are the people you work with. And so we all tend to be very highly motivated, um, really great at what we do and very supportive. So, um, this is where, I mean, in all the places I've worked overseas, there was always just this feeling of like, there is no challenge we can't find a solution to, and we just come together. So, you know, we always can call on people from other countries, we can call on advisors from other areas, and people just really come together. And I'll just give you two quick examples. Just this week, um, they were, somebody reached out and they were looking for, you know, do we have anybody that could go to Haiti because, you know, with the earthquake and response. And, um, and I emailed somebody on Monday and on Wednesday, she was on her way out, you know, and it's just that kind of attitude of like, we can drop anything and it's all hands on deck. And so it's really exciting. Um, and I think that's what, you know, people just, just love that things are moving. And the second example was um, supporting our Afghan colleagues, um, some who are seeking asylum and things like that. So there's been a lot going on in the recent months. And just again, yesterday, I reached out to two former fellows and I was like, hey, do you guys have, you know, could you switch assignments? Could you support on this? And both of them were like, yes, absolutely. And, you know, now they're, like focus 100% on it. So it's exciting, things kind of shift and change as the world changes. And, um, and it's just a really highly engaged team. Um, it's also an incredibly diverse team. 85% of our staff around the world are from the countries where they work. Um, and most of them are not Catholic. If you're thinking, do I need to be Catholic? Um, no, you do not. We all come together around those guiding principles that Caitlin shared. And those are really things that are, um, you know, kind of um, intersect with religions and people who don't come from a faith background as well. So, um, so our, our global team is highly diverse. Uh, we also have a lot of professional 
opportunities, professional development opportunities. Of course, the fellowship is a great example of that because it's a 12 month opportunity to just learn as much as you can and prepare for your next positions. But not everybody starts in CRS, of course, as a fellow, but all staff have a real host, like a large number of things that they can take advantage of. So we have really robust learning platforms um, to you know, specialize in all different kinds of topics. We also do this kind of stretch assignments where you'll go temporarily to another location or support another team. So it's a great way to kind of be do an acting role for someone else and that can help prepare you for the next step in your career. Um, and then, and then, you know, you'll run into a lot of CRSers that are kind of have been with the agency for a long time because it's so large and because we work in so many places, there's kind of um, often, uh, you know, an easy move to another place, maybe not easy, but there's always like another opportunity. So you'll find people that have worked um, all around the world in many different locations and for many years with CRS. Um, and on that note, I'll just, uh, just share really quickly. I started with CRS about 12 years ago as a fellow in Senegal. And then from there, I went to work in Darfur on water and sanitation and shelter programming. Um, after that, I went to Liberia and worked on livelihoods programming. This was around an agriculture program. And then after that, I spent about five years in Burkina Faso doing education programming. So I like to share that because it's pretty common in a way to what you'll see with fellows um, who go through the program. We tend to move around from region to region and we tend to move from sector to sector. Um, and so you and you'll get to hear from from Caitlin and from Darren um, on their their pathway as well in just a moment. And then the last thing here, you know, is the benefits. If y'all have questions about that, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm not going to go into detail or just say, you know, we have, um, you know, great coverage in terms of like all the medical and evacuation and all of that. And um, we have generous leave um, policies as well. So there's, you know, lots of things focused around well-being, which is really important, as I mentioned. We're all very hardworking and, um, you know, have to be careful we don't burn out. So I'm going to stop there, but keep um, feel free to put things in the chat. And I'm going to hand it back over to Caitlin to share a little bit about her trajectory and time with CRS. Thanks, Netta. Um, so as you all know, my name is actually Caitlin, not Jebediah, <laughs> whatever was written there. Um, so. This slide shows um, my kind of professional resume. Um, I wanted to show what all I did leading up to the fellowship and since the fellowship, because I remember when I was applying for the fellowship, I knew it was really competitive. And so I was really um, working really hard to make my resume as um, impressive as possible. Um, so as you can see, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Togo. I am a fluent French speaker and I got my master's at the University of Denver. And I worked with, I think Rayanne and Heather are on, are on this call. So we all worked together actually. And they helped me um, find a slew of internships. I was always in an internship. And then um, I snagged one with USDA and a car right before the fellowship. Um, and so that's, kind of my advice to um and yeah my advice to people who are in grad school and looking to the fellowship and looking to be competitive um i was really worried there were going to be a lot of people who had stronger international experience than i did and um or people who had internships in dc and i couldn't financially swing that um and by having a lot of different experience and um, I, and speaking French, among other things, I was competitive for the fellowship and I eventually landed it. Um, so as a fellow, I was in Madagascar and um, my master's was in global economics. And so um, I worked a lot on value chain work. So it was a massive project. Um, it was a long-term five-year project and it was really, interesting to work with. So we had technical partners, we had um, implementing partners, we had just a whole bunch of staff. And, um, and it was a really, really cool experience. And something I loved about the fellowship was that I 
built um, strong relationships with people um, who were working in the country program. So that, um, and these people helped me build my networks. And so now some people are still in the country program or they're in different parts of the world, um, still working with CRS. And, um, and they've been people I can turn to for support or maybe a pep talk, or even if I'm looking to um, expand or uh, build a new skill, I can ask them about, you know, how can I get these resources? What can I do to um, maybe make the case to do a temporary assignment? Um, it's always, that's the thing that I found the most helpful with, um, with these types of connections. Uh, and another thing is it felt like a really safe space where um, not too, I wasn't, I didn't have like the weight of a budget on my shoulders. I could um, learn everything and be mentored um, and get to know CRS. Uh, without, you know, uh, too much pressure. Um, and Cirrus is huge. So there's like a lot of systems to learn about. Um, and from my fellowship, I, um, I did do a couple of like temporary assignments, we call them TDYs. Um, and I ultimately got a position in Burkina Faso um, on a project. This is like right after Netta left, um, but she left a really great um, legacy uh, in Burkina. And, um, and I worked there for two years and it was really awesome. Um, worked, I worked predominantly with the um, farmers union. And while I say it was awesome, it was also hard. And, um, and I really, really, uh, appreciate that experience. Um, since then, I moved to the U.S. Um, and uh, it's I've been on a project support team, so I'm getting to know a lot about the ins and outs about compliance with our um, awards. So, like our contracts with the U.S. government for our projects, and it's a lot of negotiating. It's a lot of relationship building, um, and the relationship building is very, it's something that was important even in what I learned in my fellowship, that the relationships are um, really key and that's something that CRS really prizes. Um, and so since I've been here, um, I have gone from an officer position and then promoted up to manager. And that's something to say of how much um, my experience working with country program, like working in um, project implementation and everything that has really helped me actually grow within um, the main, the headquarters office. Um, I see I'm at five minutes, but I do want to mention that even though I'm based in the U.S. now, that means I, that doesn't mean that I don't have opportunities to travel um, to support direct project implementation. So for example, this past summer, I spent two months in Benin um, as an acting chief of party. So like an acting project director. And this is the picture. Um, we were in an office like up in Northern Benin and, um, and the best part of it was getting to know everybody who worked on the project and learning from them. Um, and so that's my story with CRS. Caitlin, thank you so much. And I encourage everybody to go ahead and feel free to put questions for Caitlin in the chat. Um, and we should have some chance, some time to discuss too um, as we move through the presentation. So um, this next part is focusing more on the fellowship itself. So we can dive into the meteor aspects of what is it all about. Um, so you probably heard me mention it is a 12 month program. And the intention for this program is really to, um, to help individuals, you know, train in certain areas to be to be ready to excel in onward positions with CRS. So we have a really intentional training um, program here, and it's focused on four key areas. And these are areas that we know are really critical for um, for for fellows as they move on into program management roles overseas. So the, the, four, the first area is project design and proposal development. 
So this is something that everybody at CRS is involved in, you really pretty much regardless of your role. So we all contribute in some way or another. Um, and so this is this is one focus, uh, project design. And then project management as well. Within project management, fellows gain experience in all phases of the project cycle. So they'll do some activities within startup, implementation, and closeout. Um, we have some things like monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning that is also another core component, and that's really woven throughout. So you'll do some of that during project design as you're determining you know, indicators and your theory of change and your outcomes for the program. But then you'll also be doing a lot of meal um, activities as well during project implementation, of course. So um, the third area that we focus on is partnership and capacity strengthening. So as you've heard, you know, partnership is really the heart of our approach. So everything we do is in collaboration with partners. So you'll be working closely with partners during implementation, during design, et cetera. So um, you'll do several things related to our partnership approach. And then the fourth area is operations. And operations, um, you know, kind of is a catch all for everything that's happening behind the scenes that allows us to do our work. So you would be doing support, um, supporting activities with our supply chain colleagues, with our HR colleagues, with finance, with security, with IT. So there's a number of different things that we want fellows to be involved in and to understand um, as part of this training program. So again, the idea is that when you move on, you're ready to be a really strong program manager. So as much as you know about project design, your program won't be successful if you don't know how long it's going to take to procure the materials for it, right? So we have a really strong focus on both the programming and the operations side. Um, and we have we have a, a work plan and lots of resources that we use to guide the fellows throughout and to make sure that they are able to complete this really comprehensive training. We also pair fellows with really strong supervisors along the way, and we look for supervisors who are familiar with the program. They understand what we're trying to achieve, and they can be you know that kind of close um, guiding, you know, guiding each step along the way. A lot of our supervisors um, sometimes are former fellows as well, so they know very well what the fellow is there to achieve. I tend to get a lot of questions on the overseas assignments. How do we choose the locations? Where would I be based? So I wanna say a few things about that. Um, the countries that we use every year are different. So we are really prioritizing countries that can offer this um, excellent learning experience. So it is a competitive process internally where all of our country programs, if they're interested, will apply and try to be selected to host a fellow. And so um, we look at at, you know, what is the programming there? Are they able to give the fellow opportunities in, in all of the core learning areas? And who is the supervisor and what's the experience of the supervisor? So we were really looking first at what is the best learning opportunity for the fellow. And it changes and the regions, you know, it changes as well from year to year. So we, we do usually have fellows in most regions in which, in which we work. Um, we don't put fellows in high security settings. So this is because some fellows travel with their spouse and sometimes with their children. So fellows can, you know, where we where they are based is usually the capital city and, and then it's not a high security setting. And sometimes we have to change it. Uh, for example, the fellow that just went to Guinea a couple of weeks ago, he was there for about a week before there was the coup, right? Luckily, the security um, situation wasn't, um, you know, kind of increased to this extent where we had to move him to another country, but almost every year something like that happens. So that's just the nature of, you know, where we work. So it's very important that people coming into the program understand that, um, you know, they won't have that control over where they are placed. And they may have to move at some point as well. So flexibility is really key. I always tell people, you know, if you're really passionate about a certain region or a certain sector and you just want to work in that area, then it's better to look on the CRS career site and find positions that are already identified in a certain location because we won't be able to guarantee that you get to that region or country through the fellows program and also through your onward position, because that will just depend on what is available at the time that you are transitioning. 
Um, okay, so the one thing that may kind of influence where you are placed could be your language abilities and primarily French. So French tends to be the, the main language, French, sometimes Arabic, um, that is always needed. And so if, um, fellows who speak French often are placed in a Francophone country. So that may be a determining factor. And then, of course, if you're traveling with family, then that may probably influence a little bit where you're where you're based as well. Um, but other than that, we ask the fellows to just be open to, you know, any location and we will ensure that it is um, a great location and one where you can really thrive in this program. Um, fellows receive a stipend and we also provide furnished housing. So your housing includes, you know, water, electricity, internet, um, security if it's needed, all of those good things. And you would be hired as regular staff. So you have all the same benefits and allowances as all Sierra staff. So that's medical, retirement, um, cost of living allowance, if they have that for your location, you know, evacuation insurance, all of that stuff is um, part of it. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, but the reason most people join this program is not for the stipend and the and these benefits that I've mentioned, but more so that um, they know about CRS and they they you know want to to join CRS because of the work that we do, and because of the way that we do the work. So obviously, there's many organizations out there, um, but we don't all have the same approach. So so that's why people really tend to stay or to apply. And let me just ask you guys to put in the chat um, any guess you have on what percentage of fellows continue on with CRS? Go ahead and put it, put a guess in the chat for me. Great, 50, 80, 85, awesome. Okay, so it's um, of the fellows who choose to stay with CRS, so, so we may have you know, somebody who has to go home for personal reasons or things like that, or they decide to, to go to a different organization. And, and that may be one or two people out of every class. So that's a really small number of people that would not be able to continue with CRS, but out of their own you know, voluntary choice to do that. But everyone else who um, wishes to stay with CRS and is successful in the program, um, almost all of them stay every year. And um, this is really important to us because this is, this is the intent of the program is to find and help train people that can be excellent staff overseas. So we don't bring in more people than we think we can retain each year. And that is what sort of dictates each year how many people we hire um, as fellows. So the number, it shifts a little bit um, from year to year, but you know, it's for now it's kind of in the 12 to 15 range is what, what I anticipate it will be this coming year. Okay, so here I just want to highlight, I said, you know, we were preparing fellows to move into roles, different roles. A lot of them are in the sort of programming side of things and, and not all, but most of them. That's where we tend to have, um, have more opportunities. So this list here just is to give you a little taste of what are kinds, some of the kinds of roles that the fellows have taken right after they finish their fellowship. So, so, you, so you, like for me, for example, I mentioned I did a water stand sanitation program, but every year we have a lot of people that go into meal. There's always meal opportunities. If you're an m and &E person, you'll have great work um, here ahead of you. Um, business development, program quality, emergency. There's usually a lot of fellows that are interested in working in emergencies. And actually, I should mention, I said on the previous slide that we don't base fellows in high security settings, and that's true, um, but we do allow fellows to travel to high security settings during their fellowship if they would like to. So all fellows go through like advanced security training so that they can do that. And Caitlin said something about temporary assignments. So fellows also sometimes do temporary assignments. So they, they may leave the country where they were based for the fellowship and they may go to another country for you know six weeks or something like that. And, and they may select to do that in an emergency related location and in a higher security setting. So they can get that experience as a fellow if, if they choose. Um, 
anyhow, so you see that after the fellowship, they tend to move into a whole range of different positions. And a lot of them are kind of based on related to a specific sector. So this is where people kind of gravitate back towards what they are really passionate about. So maybe, you know, in Peace Corps, like you did a lot of work in education. So, so you may use that experience now and that may help you with your onward position after the fellowship and you may go into an education related program management position. Then from there, of course, many fellows continue on with the agency. Um, you'll run into many, like I'll call them CRS lifers, like people who just have really been with the agency for their whole career. And again, that's, that's because there are so many different opportunities to pursue and always kind of a new challenge around the corner. So you don't get bored. Let me just put it that way. Um, and because of this, we have a lot of fellows who are in leadership positions today. This is just to give you an idea. Of course, these numbers change a lot, but um, we have many fellows that are in head of programming roles. Um, our country director, which we call country representative, um, and then regional leadership and, and going on from there. So on that note, I would like to hand it over to Darren. Thanks, Nada. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Darren Posey. I'm the country representative for CRS in Togo. Uh, I've been here in Togo, as you can see from this slide, since 2020. I currently manage a team of four international staff and about 50 plus uh, local country program staff. Um, and our, our projects here in Togo, uh, our main project is a large uh, U.S. government funded school feeding program where we're working with 138 primary schools to support the government's uh, school lunch program. Uh, we also have funding from the German government to support uh, social cohesion and peace building programming uh, in the north of Togo along the Togo Burkina Faso border. So to give you a, a sense of sort of my story with CRS, as you can see, I, I was also uh, similar to Caitlin, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of California, San Diego after Peace Corps. Um, I had a summer internship in San Diego with Project Concern International. Uh, and then I applied for the fellows program uh, at the end of graduate school. And to be honest, I didn't actually know much about CRS. Uh, before even applying for the fellows program. Uh, at that time, um, CRS, I, I don't think the recruiters visited UC San Diego. I heard about the program from a friend of mine who was a, a fellow Peace Corps volunteer who was working with USAID and said, you know, this is a really great program. Um, it's an opportunity to, to get back overseas. Uh, it's a good training program. So um, I applied. Uh, I do remember uh, the in-person interview. So there's a, I think there's a phone interview and then a, a second round uh, at that time was in-person interviews. Um, I was really impressed with the caliber of people that were in the room. Uh, I, I wasn't sure that I was gonna be selected looking at some of the experiences that people had. Um, and at that time, I was also really in, impressed with sort of the, 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 the way that CRS is a very, very mission-driven, partnership-oriented organization. So the people that were speaking to us during the interviews were really reinforcing the fact that, that you know, what we do is built around this mission, which is very much linked to these, cons these principles of Catholic social teaching, and that really we are overseas to be supporting our local partners to do the work. Um, and as Caitlin highlighted, we, we work with partners in almost all of our projects. So I had, uh, I had a really excellent fellowship. In, I was based in Cambodia. I was actually based outside of the capital uh, I, in a very small town with uh, one other uh, expatriate employee. Um, and I was working with Buddhist monasteries uh, on a US government funded program um, supporting local fisheries. Uh, um, and it was a really interesting opportunity. I got to use a bit of the sort of natural resources management experience that I had um, gained from Peace Corps, but also from, from my uh, sort of sectoral interest in graduate school. Um, 
I got a lot of experience in budgeting and finance and a lot of experience in proposal writing, all of which I, were, were really essential for my onward positions. Um, after leaving uh, the fellowship, I uh, shifted over. I was hired as a program manager in Pakistan, um, managing a, a refugee support. It was a, a support program for Af Afghan refugees based in Quetta, Pakistan on the Afghan border. Um, within six months, uh, the head of office left and I was promoted as the head of sub office. So uh, I was there for about 18 months. Um, I then moved uh, to West Africa uh, and I was the head of programs for CRS in Nigeria. At that time, the majority of CRS's programming was uh, PEPFAR funded. So we were running programs uh, supporting people living with HIV uh, and orphans and vulnerable children. I was then recruited to be the deputy regional director. So managing program quality across uh, Centr the Central Africa region. Um, and then uh, in 2013, I was uh, hired to be the country representative for Burundi. Uh, ultimately, they joined the position. So I managed Rwanda and Burundi. Um, and then I was moved into uh, Togo where I'm the current country representative. I would sort of, again, underline some of the things that Neda has said that, you know, the, the, the really nice thing about the fellowship program is you get uh, all these different opportunities to do different things, to work on development programs, emergency programs, uh, operations and finance, uh, proposal development, um, uh, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and because you're not sort of a program manager, you know, managing one project, you have this flexibility to kind of move around and, and try different things. It's also a really interesting opportunity because um, what I have seen with fellows and I've supervised a number of them since I've joined CRS, because you're not really managing staff so much, you get to have this relationship with the local staff in the country program that's very different from the relationship that you're likely to have later on when you're supervising staff. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really nice relationship that, um, that fellows have. I guess one last thing, um, you know, recommendations if you're interested in the fellowship. Uh, I, I know Netta highlighted languages. Um, more and more I find in this work, uh, the ability to speak uh, a foreign language uh, is really essential. Um, we have, particularly if sort of looking at countries where English is a common language, um, there's less and less need for international staff who can speak English there because the local staff are able to do the work. It's really that ability to communicate in a foreign language, but then have that strong writing and oral communication in English um, that's kind of the essential role more and more, I think, of, of international staff. Budgeting and financial finance finance is really really important. Um, that's a that's a skill that uh, international staff often bring to the table and and can work with local staff on. Obviously, writing skills. Um, I'll make a little plug for UCSD. Uh, I, I hope that the uh, policy making process class is still a requirement. I will say I use what I learned from that class all the time in terms of how how to understand how to work with government uh, in the host countries where we're working. And finally, I would just say, try to get uh, you know, as much sort of technical knowledge in different sectors as, as you can. Um, for the fellows, often uh, when you come to a country program, it's rare that you're gonna be working on just one sector or one, one project. You're usually asked to work on a broad range of, of projects. And it's always helpful, even if you have kind of a basic knowledge of, nutrition and environmental uh, sort of environment and agriculture, uh, economic strengthening and economics. Um, so I really encourage people to try to get a, a broad range of skills um, if, if you're interested in, in the fellows program and kind of moving up within CRS. So let me um, stop there because I know Nada has a few more things to talk about and then we can have some Q&A. Thank you. Aaron, thank you so much.
Um, that was so insightful. And also, I'm glad you mentioned that you have supervised many fellows and you're supervising one now. So thank you again for that. And I think you already started answering this question um, that we received on um, can fellows be, will fellows be trained in multiple sectors or will they have a choice in that kind of sector area of interest? So um, let me just, just add on to Darren's comment. We, we really don't look at kind of which area, sectoral area, like agriculture, health, you know, we don't look at, at that in terms of interest when we're doing the placement. Um, but you, because CRS works, at least in our core sectors, in most country programs, you'll find some, some um, programming in those main areas. So our objective is not to increase your knowledge in one of those areas, it's to just build your foundational skills that you can use to manage projects regardless of the sector that it's in. Um, but as sort of an added bonus, you may learn about health programming because you're working on a project design for a health project. So you're working with staff who are knowledgeable in that sector, or you may be supporting implementation of an agriculture project. So you may learn about that. Um, but you know, we don't guarantee that you will be gaining sectoral knowledge in a specific area that's more kind of like a added bonus so thank you for that question and um, there's another great question on how much work experience is required um, so actually i'll move into that right now so thank you for bringing us into our our next slide um, i'm just going to go over the requirements and the selection process and um, and that'll answer the the two questions we have here so Graduate degree, of course, you all are on track for that. So that one's straightforward. Um, Darren mentioned English, of course, is the huge value added. And, and we look at our international staff to provide, um, you know, that level, that writing and, and correspondence and all of that in English. So um, you have to be pretty much fluent in order to join this program. And then we have a second language requirement the second language can be any other language in the world, so besides English. So um, this one, we are looking for an intermediate level in the language, and we do do a language test as part of the application process. And if you really want to get into the details, I just put um, the Common European Framework for um, languages in here. And this is a scale that shows you like what is the intermediate level and profic higher proficiency. So when we do the language test, it's an oral test only. There is no written component. You do that um, either over the phone with a, with a rater or through a video um, interface. So it will, may depend depending on the language in which you are testing which interface you have um, and you would need to score in the b1 or the b2 range which is the intermediate level so in that range or above that would meet our language requirement so again you can choose any language um, we do have a preference for some languages that are spoken you know regionally so french i already mentioned arabic sometimes portuguese those are a few languages that we need in the agency and so um, we do have a slight preference there but it's usually not the deciding factor you know when we're looking at the application so if you don't speak you know french or arabic that that shouldn't at all, you know, discourage you from applying. Um, but if you, let's say you speak, you speak Bambara and you speak French, then as long as you can get intermediate level, I would recommend you test in French and that would probably influence your placement as well. So if you would like to be in a Francophone country, then I'd recommend um, testing in French. Um, then we, the second question was around work experience. So we require six months of work experience. It does need to be in a developing country. We don't want this to be your first experience in a developing country. We want to just ensure you've already been there, been through the honeymoon phase, been through the reality, and you know that you like to work in those settings. So we do want to make sure you have at least six months. Um, it does not have to be consecutive. It could have been broken up and it can be volunteer, intern, you know, any, any sort of experience that you had in the develop in a developing country. We also um, we also recruit 
each year people that are from the countries and regions where we work. So if you're from, from a developing country, and you, you know, you lived in that country and you worked in that country, then of course you would meet the requirement as well. So we really do want to encourage any um, international students on the call to consider applying as well. And um, just on that note, you do not need to have US work authorization or citizenship to, to be hired as a fellow and to work with CRS. Um, for the fellowship, we will get you a work visa for the location in which you'll be based, but you won't be working at all in the US. Um, yeah, so is a great question. Is the six months kind of a hard requirement? I would say, um, yeah, pretty much because we do have we do have many candidates. And so, um, you know, we would we would go for the candidates that meet that requirement. Um, but, you know, there was a question earlier about internships. So I would say, you know, if you have as you know, if you know, if you have an opportunity to get a little bit more experience overseas through an internship, I would really recommend it. Um, with CRS, we do offer overseas internships, and um, there is information on our website about that. I can share it in the chat. Um, maybe during the Q and A part, I will grab a link and put it in the chat for you there. Um, yeah, if you went to school in a developing country and you lived there for a certain amount of time, um, yes, still apply. So thank you for that question. Um, and then another question, which languages do you get? Do you get tested again for languages? Do you get tested again through your organization? Um, if, um, do you, if you mean sort of get tested again at other times, like when you're moving on to another position, um, let me see if you if you won't mind clarifying for the fellowship we just do the one language test oh i see yeah um so thank you so yeah so when you're in peace corps tanzania and you you got tested um we would still do our own test for whichever language you know if you did swahili or something we would still test you um again you know as part of the requirements because we we have all of our candidates follow the same process um we have had cases where our testing partner did not offer a language and so in that case we we looked to see what we could use as a proxy um but that's pretty rare but again just to tell you we do accept all languages um as part of that so very good um so what you have on on paper, of course, is one thing, but what we're looking for most importantly in the interview process is your attitudes and motivations. So we're looking for people who are, you know, very agile, very flexible, um, you know, very focused on developing others. That is one of the, our hugest value adds, you know, overseas. So with our partners and with our staff. So we're looking for people that have that mindset. Um, and are very proactive um, in all of that. So, so when you get through the going into the application process, and let me show you that right here, and I'll come back to the last slide. Um, we're looking at the online application is the first step, and here we're just looking at those those minimum criteria for the program. Then we'll start looking at really who you are, and you know your 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 behaviors and attitudes, and we'll do that first through a video interview. The video interview is actually a pre-recorded interview, so it's very straightforward. You'll see somebody asking you the question, you'll have a little bit of time to reflect, and then it will start the recording and you'll have two minutes to give your response. Um, so that's that first part where we start really understanding more about who you are and what, what motivates you to do this kind of work. And then the candidates moving forward from that stage will move then to the foreign language test. And so, and I mentioned that will be um, either over the phone with a rater or through another video platform, depending on the language. And then our finalists who, who come out of that stage, then we'll do what used to be in-person interviews, but for now is do, being done virtually. Um, it's a lot of fun. We have our panelists are from all over the world um, who come and do the interviews. 
We also do a group activity. We understand not everybody thrives and shines in a panel. So we really try to look at our candidates in a lot of different settings and really give you exam um, opportunities to shine. So um, the interview day is a lot of fun. You learn a lot about CRS. We learn a lot about you. And then after that, we make our offers. At this point, at the final, final offer stage, that's when we would say we're making you an offer for Uganda, for example, or for Laos, for example. So that's at the point where you would finally find out where is it that CRS is um, proposing that I go for my fellowship. And as you can see, it is a long process. It, it does take many months. Um, so, you know, so you have to be patient and hang on for the ride. Um, but before I and my kind of end on this section, I just wanted to say the application is live on our website. Um, it will be up until November 1st. So you have the whole month of October to, to consider and to submit your application. Um, and then I just want to draw your attention to our cover letter. So the cover letter is required as part of the application. And we have a specific prompt that we ask you to address. So, so not just the, not kind of a general cover letter, but really focusing on responding to this question. And it, the question is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, if I had more time, I would love to tell you about everything going on within CRS around that topic. Um, but um, it is really important and a focus for the agency. And we wanna make sure that candidates coming in are also in that mindset. So this cover letter piece is important. So please make note of that, but don't worry because it's all on the website. So, you know, you don't have to worry about missing anything. And that is all of my slides. And I see there's one more question in the chat. Um, does traveling in developing countries count? So I would say, um, not unless it was kind of a real like you were there for a long time um, and you were kind of living there for a month or two, then I would count it. Um, but if it was like a, a two week trip here or there, if you can string those through and you were kind of doing something meaningful while you were there, then then yeah. I mean, any way you can add it up to six months is fine. Um, but usually the kind of short trips don't 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 add a lot in terms of kind of what we're looking for for that experience. I hope that answers your question. Unfortunately, we only have two minutes left. I was hoping we'd have more, but I guess I'm always a little bit more long-winded than I realize. Um, but we do have a couple of minutes for questions. While folks talk I, or type their questions with the brief time we have, I did wanna ask, given the length of time that um, the process takes, do you recommend that students apply now, even if they don't complete their degrees until yes. after the program finishes? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for, for raising that, Carmen, indeed. So this, our application that's open now is for the class starting in August of next year. So it's one annual class, one class each year. So if you're in the second year and you're graduating in May, this is the time to apply. And then we'll go through this application process and you'll have your offer in the spring. And then you get to be like so relaxed and excited because you already have a job and then you get to enjoy the rest of your school year and the summer. So yes, it, this would be the time to apply for anyone in their second year. Fantastic, thank you. And if folks had uh, questions that they couldn't get answered today, is the email address on the screen the best way to follow up with you? Yes, that idfp1 at crs.org. Indeed, um, I checked that box. I don't promise to get back to you immediately, but I will. So um, this is it. You can definitely reach me there. Wonderful. So everyone, I want to thank you again for being a part of this conversation. I absolutely want to thank Netta and Caitlin and Darren for sharing all of their wisdom. Uh, you make all of APSIA proud with the great work that you're doing, and we look forward to sending so many more students to follow in your footsteps out to help make the world um, a slightly better place. So thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks to all of our speakers for sharing their wisdom. As I said, this presentation will be up on our YouTube page shortly, and we look forward to seeing all of you at future APSIA events. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Carmen.